Well, good morning. Welcome to the worship service of the Franklin Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you're here today. God bless you for joining us. Uh, we are really blessed today with a special guest, Brother Lonnie Shipman. Uh, he spoke in the Sunday School Hour a very interesting message about uh, uh, about music and about the stars singing out. And uh, what a wonderful blessing that was. And he's going to be playing the piano for us today as well. But I'd like to welcome you. I'm so glad that you are here to worship with us today. And uh, this is the day the Lord has made. And uh, we will rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm glad we can come and celebrate our Lord and Savior together today. So let's begin here with a word of prayer. Let's ask God to bless us as we meet here together with every head bowed and with every eye closed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for Jesus who died to save us from our sins. Dear Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have of being a part of your work and a part of your church. And I just pray right now, dear Lord, you bless this service that we have together. You just meet with us, dear Lord. You speak to hearts and lives and you just challenge us, dear Lord. You just be present here, dear Lord, and work in a great and mighty way. Just, dear Lord, just use the music, dear Lord. Just use the preaching of your word to challenge us and to convict us. And dear Lord, I pray that each of us would just open up our ears and our minds and our hearts to receive what you have for us and to be obedient to it, dear Lord. Help us to glorify and honor you as, as we lift our voices in song, as we give our offerings, as we yield ourselves today to your perfect will. Just bless and be with us, dear Lord, and use us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, as our piano player comes back up, uh, why don't you go ahead and stand uh, as we get ready to sing hymn number 410, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. All right, and on to our next song, hymn number 762, What a Day That Will Be. I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There will be no sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. 
Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your singing. You may be seated. Amen. What a blessing it's been to hear the piano playing today. And uh, what a blessing it is to have Brother Lonnie Shipman with us. At this time, uh, he's going to play through a selection of songs here for us. And so so you listen and maybe you can hum or maybe even quietly sing along. But he's going to be a blessing to us here with the piano today. Brother Lonnie. Is this on? Yes, sir. I know the power. Well, good morning to every single one of you. We know that several years ago, there was a, a man who was born into a ship family, a ship sailor's family. The mother was worried about the little boy he was when he was born because the sailing life was a wicked life. So she wanted her little boy to grow up and become a Christian. As a little boy, she would read him the Bible and she would teach him Bible verses. But he longed to go to the, be in the sea, to be a sea captain like his father. So when his mother died, soon he ran away from home and joined became a cabin boy was nine years old in a ship and then when they were 14 that ship was captured by pirates he was captured by the sea captain and he was chained to the ship itself every day the captain would come in and beat him with chains he was not saved and he grew to actually admire the man who was beating him and thinking he's tough but I'm gonna be tougher than him and he's beating me with chains but one day I'll get free and show him I'm even tougher when he was 19 he gained his freedom and he became the ship captain and they said he was so mean and cruel that one day he was washed overboard. It was, a, it was the duty of the, of the sailors to save the captain, but he acted more like an animal, so they didn't want to treat him like a normal captain. They went and got a harpoon and harpooned him and brought him back on board. He limped the rest of his life with that leg because he had been so cruel to the captains of the people. And they said that they, people tried witnessing and telling him about God, but he didn't want to hear it. Finally, one day, one person gave him a Christian book to read, and the ship got into a terrible storm. He said he'd been in bad storms before, but nothing like this. It was the old sailing days with the tall mast ships, and the sea boat was being turned to where the one side the sails would dip and then turn to the other side the sails would dip. So literally, they were afraid it was going to flip completely over. He was the only one brave enough to even go on top of the deck. He tied himself to a mast and tried to steer the ship in this and said, if there is a God, please save me out of the storm. And some people said, Jesus is the true God. If you're really God, please save me out of the storm. Soon the storm subsided, and the ship limped its way to a nearby harbor, and he saw there a ship next to his boat, captained by a friend of his. He went over to see his friend. Ahoy there. Hey, John. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a year. Something wonderful has happened to me. I've come to know Jesus as my Savior. Well, that's what I need to know about. And there his friend told John how to be saved, and John was saved. But then it took John about a year to get rid of his wicked life that he had been living. Eventually he got married and even became a preacher. They said he had been such a cruel man, they could not believe that he turned into a godly man, but God gradually turned him into someone who became really a godly pastor. And he was later asked to write a, help put together a hymnal. They had room for one little song left. They said, John, tell your testimony in that last hymn. So he included a song that told his testimony. The song called Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
you so much. Glad to be here with you today again. And of course, see Brother Dave's and other folks we've seen for many years. And I've been to this church actually about six times now. Glad to be here under three pastors and see how God has continued to use you in a great way. I myself an evangelist, Lonnie Shipman. I've traveled as an evangelist several years. My dad was a pastor 67 years. My mother was head of piano at a Baptist University. All of us started piano early. I started piano at four. Like the rest of the kids, we all started very early. And I was doing collegiate piano in third grade when I was nine, like I graduated from college. Then I went to college at 12 and studied advanced music until I was 15. I won six international competitions in music, traveling as a teenager worldwide in piano, then called to preach. Can you imagine? I thought, what in the world is God doing called a piano player to preach? <laughs> and so I was playing Beethoven. How can I use Beethoven for God? So I started then preaching and using the piano to draw people to hear the gospel. And I've been traveling now for several years. The Lord's enabled me to preach in 27 countries and preached in here for 10 million people. So the Lord's really worked in a great way. Glad to be with you today. I'm going to play for you a song next about how not only God saves us, but God gives us assurance of our salvation called Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. song for you. It's a song about heaven, actually. The song is called, Shall We Gather at the River? Now, many of you have heard this. It's sort of a, sort of a country song. Often played sort of like... flavor of a sort of small country church. I thought, well, let me take it and make it a romantic type song. Can you imagine that as a romantic song? <laughs> and take it more of a classical romantic flavor. And think about really going to heaven. The song is really not talking about the river of oh, here on earth. It's used at baptism because it has a river in the song. But it's really talking about the river in heaven. Gathering with all the saints in heaven one day. And think about what it would be like to stand there the river of life with all the saved loved ones of ours that have gone on before us. And to be there with Jesus himself as we're there in the presence of God forever in glory. So this is a song about heaven. Shall we gather to river?
so much, Brother Lonnie. At this time, we're going to get around fellowship, shake hands, greet one another. We're going to dismiss our kids to head on back to Children's Church. But at this time, we get around fellowship a little bit and uh, let one another know you appreciate it. seated as we sing our final song, hymn number 153, Worthy of Worship.
you sing today. Amen. Thank you. Because our ushers make their way forward, let's go on ahead and let's worship the Lord with our giving uh, here today. We're going to take up a special love offering uh, for uh, Brother Shipman at the end of the service. But right now, let me encourage you to be faithful with your tithes and offerings. If you've not dropped in your Faith Promise Commitment Card, please let me encourage you to do that today. Uh, we got a special missions meeting Wednesday. We want to be able to take on some new missionaries. And knowing what our commitments are really helps with that. But you make a commitment to give towards missions this year. And you be faithful with your tithes. And, and all the offerings that God leads you to give towards as well. With every head bowed and every eye closed, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege that we have of giving and being a part of your work, dear Lord. And help us, I pray, to give obediently and generously to you today. Help us to give cheerfully, dear Heavenly Father, as we know that, uh, that, that these monies that we give are participating in your work, dear Lord, and are used to see souls saved and lives changed here at the Franklin Baptist Church and around the world. We thank you, dear Lord, for the uh, many blessings that you've given us. And just help us, I pray, to give give back of our of our tithes and our offerings, dear Lord, and of ourselves as well. And help us as a church, Lord, to be good stewards of this offering and just bless it and use it according to your according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I know he's been a blessing to me. At this time, he's going to come and preach for us. And I know, I know God's word is going to touch your heart today. And with all that's going on in the Middle East, all that's going on in the world, we ought to be looking, looking out and looking up for Christ's soon return. And so I know this message is going to be a special blessing. Brother Lonnie, come and preach for us. Blessing to be here today again with you. Today we're going to talk about the coming of the Lord and several events. Now you know about the war, of course, in Israel. And I heard today on the way here, by the way, an interview of a terrorist on two different radio channels, the same terrorist. I thought, wasn't that strange? First thing you do is interview, the, of course, the wrong people. Uh, the people who came and killed the Jews. And then they did on one of the show talk about the, the tragedy with, with, of course, the killing the Jews there in Israel. Israel then defending himself rightfully, as any country should, of course. If we were attacked by terrorists, don't you think we should defend ourselves? And so the same kind of thing. Okay, well, what does this have to do with prophecy? Well, we're not specifically going to speak on that today because I didn't really plan to do that. I can do that, but I didn't really plan to do that today. There's other things happening in Israel that show us we're also coming close to 
to the coming of the Lord. We know the event, next event on God's calendar for the world is actually the rapture of the believers. Soon Jesus is coming to take us away to heaven. And there are no signs for the rapture. The rapture is signless, meaning it can happen at any moment. Jesus is coming soon. We don't know when. It could happen at any moment. But there are signs for happening for later, for the tribulation, and after that, for the Armageddon time. We've heard of the battle of Armageddon. So if we're getting close to the tribulation and the Armageddon, which happened after the rapture, we're very close to the rapture, you see. So we're going to speak about really events pointing toward the rapture today. And another event that is related to this, not really a war, but other things in part of laying up the, uh, you might say, the, uh, to, to laying the events in order, showing we're close to the time. Now in Ezekiel chapter 30, uh, 37, we're going to look at several verses of Scripture. And today we're going to talk about treasure and the coming temple of God. Really two main issues here. Uh, somewhat three, uh, the rebuilding of the Jewish temple for the tribulation period which the Antichrist would desecrate and destroy and also the search for the Ark of the Covenant and the ashes of the red heifer which are connected to that rebuilding of the temple. If the Antichrist will desecrate and destroy the temple and the temple they're trying to build it now that means we're close. So we're going to talk about the current events going on now for rebuilding the temple and the search for the Ark. But well, here now, let's look at Ezekiel 37, verse 11. It says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Let me see if I can go back myself and read a little better here, my notes. Uh, Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say thus unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, and when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and, have put my, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, and performed it, saith the Lord. And notice it's interesting, Ezekiel has been taken in a vision to a valley full of dry bones. And he's commanded to stand and preach to a whole valley full of skeletons. Talk about faith. Think about that. Preaching to a valley full of skeletons. That's a dead church if I ever heard of one. <laughs> okay, so he stands and preaches to this valley full of skeletons. And the skeletons, the bones start to gather together, bone to bone. And then flesh and sinew come upon them. And then skin gathers around them. And then they stand up and face him like an army. But they're not alive. They're like zombies. Then it says the Spirit of God comes and moves into them, and they become a living, breathing army. And this is the, re the gathering of Jews to the land, like an army, coming back to the land, and then how God puts His Spirit into them again. Also later in the chapter, he talks about how they're like, two, like a stick that was broken apart and became the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And he's going to take the stick and mend it back together, which will be one stick again. Ezekiel 37, verse 21. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Next passage, let's see. There it is, okay. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make one, one nation in the land upon the mountains uh, upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be two more, at least no more, two more nations, neither should be divided into two more kingdoms any more at all. So God is actually taking them from a combined kingdom to, to from a separated kingdom of two nations back to a combined kingdom back in the last days. So we're gathered together as one complete nation. And as they're going to have also one king, and they're not going to be two nations anymore. And also they're going to specifically be in the mountains of Israel. Now where are the mountains of Israel? That's what we call today the Western Bank. So they'll come first to the land. They did in, that, in 1948. They were declared their own nation, May 14, 1948. And then they took the mountains of Israel. When they were attacked by the Arab nations, 17 nations came and said, we'll kill all the Jews. We'll drive them into the sea. And in six days, they had not only beat the armies, they even had a larger kingdom and captured Jerusalem and the mountains of Israel, the Western Bank, which the Bible specifically says they're going to take the mountains of Israel when they have, you see. Then we have... Another interesting thing. The Bible said that they're going to be one day going to have the Messiah again. And it says, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. 
Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of the coming Messiah and Jewish prince who will sit upon the day throne of his father David because he one day bodily and visibly will sit and rule upon the throne of his father David in the millennial kingdom. He's not come yet as the king. He came first as the savior. Later he's coming as the king. You see, there's two parts to the coming. But he will come later, the kingdom age, often referred to, referred to as the millennium, when God will rule the world for a thousand years. Jesus will literally be the king of kings and lord of lords, ruling the kingdom and a combined kingdom of justice and righteousness. And the people of Israel will reside forever in their promised land. And God will make a covenant of peace with them. Notice another passage. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It should be an everlasting covenant with them. I will place them and multiply them. And my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. So God is saying, one day future, He's going to make a covenant of peace with Israel. Notice who makes the covenant of peace. Is it the PLO? Is it Hamas? No, is it Russia or some other group? Is it even the Antichrist? No, the one that makes covenant of peace here, the final covenant of peace, is the Lord God Himself. And it will be an everlasting covenant of peace. And he says he'll place them, and the sign that he's come back to the land is when his sanctuary, his temple, is built again. But not only will they have the temple, they'll also have the tabernacle. Now this is the clearest point uh, we have in the Bible to them searching for the Ark of the Covenant. Some of you wonder about these Indiana Jones movies and things. Did they really find the Ark and all that? They really are looking for the Ark in 21 locations in 10 countries, and they've actually found an Ark. So we talk about that in my book and all these things. I show you pictures of, this, of what's going on and, and also where the temple will stand in the time of the tribulation and later the time of the millennium. That's why I wrote these books. And, and since I've been seeing all that, I've been a little busy here. But anyway, we, we know a lot of these things are coming together now. Now, the interesting thing is the point that they're showing God is back in the land is that God's temple was standing again. And they also believe they must have the tabernacle, and with the tabernacle, the actual Ark of the Covenant. They think in their idea they can make a menorah, a seven-branch candlestick, make other things to put in the temple, but they must have the actual Ark. If they don't have the actual Ark, they don't have the actual presence of God. They can make a copy of other things, but they must have the actual Ark to have God in the temple. So they're looking for the real ark. The way they know they have the real ark is because it has the Ten Commandments inside the real ark. And there were actually two arks in the Old Testament. Now, when I first read the rabbis about this, I thought, they must be mistaken. There's only one ark mentioned. But then they kept mentioning this, and I finally found evidence in the Bible there are two arks. When Moses was given the first Ten Commandments, he was told to make an ark that became like a pattern for a later ark, Bezalel made, that they put in the temple and the tabernacle. So Moses' ark was the first ark, a pattern for the later ark that they used in the temple and tabernacle. The first ark Moses made, they put later the broken Ten Commandments. Bezalel made, came and made another more beautiful, probably fashioned ark that they used in the tabernacle and the temple with the full set of Ten Commandments. Aaron's rod that budded the pot of manna, all these things, and five scrolls of the Pentateuch in Moses' own handwriting inside that ark. I think if they found either ark, they'd be happy. <laughs> they find either one to have God back. So they're looking for these things, you see. Now, the Bible says will be peace in the temple again, and that at this last at this time Jesus will come back soon in something called the tribulation period. But for this to happen, first of all, there must be a rapture of the saints, and the God will come and take the saved to heaven in the, what's called the rapture of the believers or rapture of the saints. All the saved will rise to meet the Lord, for the Lord Himself shall come from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So we know that Jesus is coming first to take us to heaven in the rapture. Then there will be a time of tribulation when the Antichrist will rule the world for seven years of the tribulation period. And he'll, he'll then go into the temple that's ready to destroy it. We're trying to today put this temple today back in the land again. This is the temple of the time of Jesus. They're trying to put it back in the land. And, they, and the Antichrist will go into the temple and desecrate and destroy it. Then, the, then Jesus will come at the end of the tribulation and defeat the Antichrist and his forces at the Battle of Armageddon. They know they're looking today for peace to come because they're looking for some way to bring peace. But peace will only come when Jesus, that great branch, will come and bring peace 
we know that when he comes, behold, the man whose name is a branch, he shall grow up in his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be the priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So he is going to be both priest and king. And then we'll have peace in both religion and peace in government at the same time, you see. That's the millennium, when God comes to reign on earth. So when he comes, there'll be true peace. But before this, Antichrist comes. And Antichrist comes, of course, in the tribulation and desecrates and destroys the earlier temple. And then the people will flee into the mountains. It said in, uh, in Matthew 24, Wherefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, this is when the Antichrist goes to the temple, desecrates and destroys it, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, that's when he's standing in the temple, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So the Jews will flee into the mountains of Petra, of Basra in the Old Testament, same place. Petra is Hebrew, I'm oh, sorry, is, is Greek, Basra is Hebrew, the same word, the same location. They're going to Petra to hide in the mountains. And at that, and then God will come later in the Battle of Armageddon and save them. But we know before they do this, they're trying to build a temple now. This temple, the Jews believe, they're looking for not Jesus. They're looking for another Messiah. They don't understand Jesus is a true Messiah. And they're looking for someone to bring about peace now. They even have debates. Should we bring the build the temple and wait for Messiah to come? Or should we wait till Messiah comes and builds the temple? Well, they don't understand. The Bible says there's two temples. Temple for the Tribulation and Temple for the Millennium. One thing they're looking to do is searching for the ashes of the red heifer. They're looking for a red cow to actually use to then actually use these ashes to cleanse the temple building, cleanse the priests, and then build the temple itself. The Bible tells us that in Numbers chapter 19, Israel had sinned. And so they were commanded to commit a, a sacrifice, the most mysterious sacrifice in all the Old Testament, Numbers 19, where they use these ashes of a female cow, sort of a young, young heifer, not a technically a cow, but sort of like a cow, uh, to use this, these ashes to cleanse the temple building and the priests. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar came in the Old Testament and destroyed the temple and burned it, later when the Jews came back under Zerubbabel in 536 B.C., they found the earlier ashes of the red heifer. They rebuilt the temple, but they could not use the temple until it had been cleansed with the earlier ashes. They also had to cleanse the people. So they cleansed their priests also, so he could make another sacrifice, and then have more ashes, you see, and cleanse all the people and everything. And then they built the temple again. So they're looking for, first, the ashes of an old red heifer. It was committed in the past, from Moses to the time of Ezra, there's been seven. They're looking for a pot of these ashes to cleanse the priest to make a new sacrifice of another heifer to have more ashes to cleanse the building. You see, even if they build the building, they cannot use it until it's first cleansed. They have chosen already the priest line. They even have done DNA structure. The testing to determine you had to have a certain DNA to determine you're a Kohanim priest, a priest of the line of the Jews. This is part of the Jewish priest line. And they've proven that with DNA now. Can you imagine that? So if you have a certain DNA that matches it and you're willing to be a priest, you can be a priest, but not until you're cleansed. So they had to find the earlier ashes to cleanse a priest, to make a sacrifice, and then find another little red heifer that's perfectly pure and make it another sacrifice to cleanse everybody else and all the buildings. That's why they're really looking for two things. Now, many of you know they've been looking for heifers' ashes throughout the world, and they're trying to birth heifers in Israel, in Europe, in Mississippi, and in Texas. Now, when I read about this, I thought, isn't that something? Recently, a rancher from Texas sent, we you may know, several candidates, five red heifers, as candidates for a possible new sacrifice. His name is Byron Stinson, Texas rancher Byron Stinson. Through my brother, I met Byron Stinson several years ago. Isn't that amazing? And here he, he actually raised 30 heifers to send over, but he couldn't get 30 authorized to go. He wasn't allowed to send any heifers, technically, to Israel. But they said, can we send a pet? Yes, you're allowed to send five pets. So we sent five pet little 
red cows to these Jewish rabbis, which they're going to use as sacrifices now. That's why he sent five. They had, the ones he sent are about six months old, and they have to be about three years old. So they're going to grow and see if they have any. If the heifer has to be so perfectly pure. It can't have any blemish or defect. It has to be every way physically pure, and every hair on the heifer has to be perfectly red. Uh, reading these rabbis is hilarious. One rabbi said it can have up to 54 hairs that are, that are white or some other color if you pull them all out. Another rabbi said it's going to have two hairs if one's on his nose and the other's on his tail. And I thought that was pretty hilarious. Long ways away. Well, most of them say you can have more than just one hair that's not red. So they're really looking for a perfectly pure heifer. Even the eyelashes and the hooves have to be red on the heifer. And so they, they sent five red heifers over. And, and Byron Stinson was interviewed saying, I didn't set out to do this, but right now I'm probably the best red heifer hunter in Texas. I thought it was hilarious when he said that. He told Israel 65, 365 News, the prophecies came true, and the Jews are back in Israel. Now they need to build a temple, but the red heifer is the key to making the temple work like it's supposed to. And they've been looking for it. And then Rabbi Solomon Gorin said that he's been looking for the Ark of the Covenant. That's another thing. They're looking for the actual Ark of the Covenant. Indiana Jones didn't find it after all, but they're still looking for the Ark. And Rabbi Gorin said, I started digging just beneath the Temple Mountain from outside just a few years ago. We were very close to the plate of the Temple Mount where the Holy of Holies was located. We believe the Holy Ark made by Moses and the table for the Temple and the candle opera by Moses along with other important items are hidden very deep under the Holy of Holies. We were only 30 or 40 yards away, but the Arabs rioted and attacked us and they stopped us and built a wall to prevent them from digging, further digging. Rabbi Getz said, Rabbi Getz said, we know where the ark is, but we did not discover it. According to the rabbinical writings, it's deep within the ground, and we became very close, but it's impossible to reach because it's deep under the water that flooded the tunnels. Another rabbi said, if we find the ark, it would force us to build the temple. And what he said was interesting. After all, the first temple was built to house the ark of the covenant. If we find the ark, what would we do with it? We couldn't store it in the prime minister's basement. It would demand the rebuilding of the temple. However, if we find the ark or not, we are going to build the temple of Almighty God on the Har Habayit, the holy mountain of God. And then Rabbi Gershon Solomon said, I have no doubt that you and I shall see the ark of the covenant in the middle of the third temple on the temple mountain in Jerusalem very soon in our own lifetime. The ark of the covenant cannot be put in a museum or in a synagogue or in, but only in one place, the temple. We know we are the, uh, the generation, the destruction of the first temple hit the ark for the time of the third temple, and we are in that last generation. So they believe they're going to pull out the ark very soon. They know where it is. They're just waiting for the right time, and you go in and get it and put it in the temple. And then we know that there's also going to be a battle of Armageddon. The Antichrist will come at the end of the tribulation and fight. And he's going to come actually to kill all the Jews. You may know the Jews have fled to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, he's coming with an army to kill them in Jerusalem. But an earthquake has happened and separated the, country, the city into three parts. And one third of the Jews are, are there in Jerusalem. He's coming quickly to kill them. They cannot stop him. There's no way they can flee anywhere. But then an earthquake happens and seals off the city and they can't get to the Jews. So then the Antichrist turns his forces to the Jews. He's heard about hiding in Petra and goes down to flee and, and, and they've gone down there to kill them. And then they realize this is it. G the Antichrist is coming to kill us. There's no hope left. And then Jesus appears in the sky, coming with a thousand of his saints to fight against the Antichrist and his forces. And he speaks his word and slays the Antichrist forces just with one word. That's why there's so much blood. Literally cutting them in half, the bodies of the armies in half, for 120 miles. So that's why there's blood rising, the horse's bridle, whatever that is, however high it is, for a long ways. So then, then Jesus ascends then on Mount of Olives and sets up his reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords on Mount Moriah, the next mountain over the Temple Mountain. Now, for this to happen, the Jews that really believe they must build a temple soon for the coming of Messiah. And by the way, when Jesus comes back again, all Israel will realize in Romans, Revelation 1-7, Behold, he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Everyone shall wail because of him, even so, amen. So they're wailing, screaming, and crying, he's coming. 
and he's coming in judgment. But then Israel turns to the Lord and all of Israel is saved in one day. So then Israel, the people that are left, are saved and go into the millennium as well as other millennial believers, other believers in tribulation go into the millennium. But before this to happen, there's current events going on now, again for the temple. One thing is, they're trying, I mentioned the DNA for the priests. They've determined the priests, other things like this. But they've also found and determined the way that they built the instruments of music. Two different kinds of harps, a triangular harp and a lyre harp, as well as trumpets. And when I went to, to uh, go preach in Israel, I was going first to Belgium and Holland in 1992. I was a little younger, 1992. And I was going over there as a concert pianist to preach in Europe. I felt God had given me this background in piano before I was called to preach. It must be some way. How do I use piano for God? How can I use Beethoven for God? What can I do? Oh, let's go preach to the Europeans because classical music is popular in Europe, like in Germany, places like this. So I'll go to Europe and preach. As I got ready to go to Europe, to Belgium and Holland for about three weeks, my dad's closest friend in seminary was Aubrey Richardson. He had also got a master's in music and Bible like my dad did, and they graduated together, and he was there when my parents met, the night they met, all this a lifelong friend of our family, like an uncle to me. But he also became an engineer of the F-16 fighter jet. He was promoted to be the top engineer, mathematics degree in engineering also, and he became the top engineer of the F-16 fighter jet. The F-16 was originally built in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I'm from Dallas-Fort Worth. And so I was going to preach in Belgium and Holland. Aubrey now been sent to Israel to build an F-16 specifically for Israel, you know, a similar one. And he was over the project, the head guy in Israel. He, he heard I'm going to be preaching in Belgium, Holland. Say, get yourself on a plane. Come on down to Israel. You're only five hours away by plane. I'll set you up everywhere preaching in Israel. Well, I never thought about preaching in Israel. I was going to go to Belgium and Holland, and then also later to Germany. No, he said, no, come to Israel. And I thought, if I could go to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, maybe God can bless a missionary trip. You see, my first missionary trip. So I go preach in Belgium, Holland, and I go down to Israel preaching for six weeks. When I land, I'm dressed casually, jeans, a, 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 a polo shirt, tennis shoes. He says, get in the car fast. Your plane was late. We got to go see the ambassador. The American ambassador to Israel? He's waiting to see you. Get in the car. What are you talking about? No, we got to go see the ambassador and invite him to the meetings. You're coming here to preach. We got to go meet him. Well, I got to change in my suit. We don't have time for that. Everybody's casual in Israel. Just get in the car. So we go off down to the Israel embassy, invite the ambassador, the American ambassador, who I meet at that moment, to come preach for me. They said that they put me in a Mediterranean villa to stay while I'm preaching there for six weeks. This is not a normal trip, a missionary trip. <laughs> it's amazing. I fell in all this because we already knew everybody. Then they said three days later, hey, let's, um, let's go meet the top archaeologist and rabbis. So we just went and interviewed them and the archaeologist said would you like to go on a tour of the underground passageways of Jerusalem and tour eight of the eleven Dead Sea Scroll Caves? Sure, I'm here six weeks. So I was able to do all that. And they also set up an escort for me from the CIA, taking me like a bodyguard everywhere I went in a government vehicle. It was unbelievable. It's not your normal missionary trip. So through this, I interviewed the rabbis, found out how they're rebuilding the temple. That's where these, these, this study came from, you see, from that time. And they're continuing to do this today. Now, while there, I was invited to go to the harp factory where they make the harps, the Harari Harp Factory. And my mother and my sister play harp very well. I can play three songs. So they took me in there, and I played, of course, many instruments. Everybody in my family plays 10 to 12 instruments. I play 12. We all play about 10 or 12 each. So we all play basically all the keyboard, all the brass, all the, the string bowed, like violin type stuff. Okay, so I'm there in the, in the harp factory. The lady plays me a song. She said, would you like to play? Sure. So I play our first song. Oh, you can play the harp. I only know three songs, but I didn't tell them. <laughs> so I played the second one. Oh, that was good. Can you play another one? Sure. Play my third song. That's enough. <laughs> That's all I knew, three songs. And I saw the trumpets on the wall. Hey, can I play the trumpets? You played the trumpet too? Sure. Let's play the trumpets. So I was able to play the short and the long trumpets they have for the Tribulation Temple. I think I'm the only prophecy speaker who actually ever got to play the instruments of music for the Tribulation Temple. Isn't that amazing? Because the, I was taken there by a CIA guy who knew these people. So anyway, they were trying to build these harps and trumpets and trying to then determine what the temple will look like. They believe they're determined by doing study they build a temple similar to the temple of Jesus' time, the Herod Temple, to build for the tribulation period. They also have found something else. With the Dead Sea Scrolls, in one of the scrolls, they've found it describes building a temple for the tribulation. 
together with some other things in the Bible. And hidden in the caves, they found some of these scrolls. Here I am, by the way, in cave 4A. This is the first, this is one of the caves, like this, it's this earlier group of caves. You see the caves here? The one in the middle, cave 4A, where 80% of all Dead Sea Scrolls were found. I was invited to tour several of the caves, including this the middle of this, this middle cave. You can see in the middle this famous one, and here I am inside the cave, 16 stories from the ground floor. So it was a great privilege to be there, where 80% of all ancient scrolls of the Bible were found. The greatest archaeological discovery of all the world, the ancient Bibles. By the way, they found more copies of Isaiah than any book of the Bible, and they had claimed that Isaiah was not written by Isaiah, but written by two fake Isaiahs in the time of Jesus. When they found Isaiah, they found not only one Isaiah, they found a bunch of copies of Isaiah, and they found it complete. And it was copies of an older Isaiah proving Isaiah did write the Bible, not two fake Isaiahs later, but it was just like the Bible said, Isaiah was written by the Word of God and preserved word for word, just like your King James Version Bible. Isn't that something? By the way, they only found four of over 12,000 manuscripts, four that did not agree word for word with your King James Bible, only four out of thousands. So it shows God's preserved our word. Isn't that amazing? Okay, now back to the story. Okay, so then they, they went to these caves, and they found in one cave a temple scroll that describes building a temple this way. Similar to the Herod Temple, but a little differences. So this is what the Tribulation Period Temple will look like, which the Antichrist will desecrate and destroy. But later, after the Battle of Armageddon, Jesus will build another temple. The description of the, of the Millennial Temple is different. And this is given in Ezekiel 40 to 48. Uh, the Millennial Temple is a much larger building, much, much larger. Now, the tr Temple of the Jesus' time would be um, roughly the size of this auditorium with buildings around it, okay? The main temple building itself, but taller inside. It's about three and a half stories tall. But it's, it's similar to the size of this auditorium, slightly. Not exactly, but close to with, the, with your, rock, your, your, your foyer, your lobby combined, all this. About the size of the temple, okay? But the Temple of the Millennium is five miles around one building. Each side of the building is 1.3 miles long. Think of that much, much larger. When Ezekiel saw it, he said, what I'm seeing in Ezekiel 40, verse 2, he said, describing the temple building as he said, looking at it, he says, looks like a frame of a city. The one building was larger than any ancient city he had ever seen. One building. In this one, in his mind, the one building looks as large as any ancient city he had ever seen. And then an angel came and measured the city with a flax called a reed to measure the city. The length of the reed was 12 feet. As he watched the angel take measurements, Ezekiel was amazed by what he saw. This temple was not just a large building, situated in the middle of a city. To the mind of Ezekiel, the temple building looked like the entire city. The angel measured the outer wall around the temple building, which was 500 reeds long which was really 12 feet, 3 inches. The triple building was placed inside this outer square wall. He saw the wall 500 reeds long, or 6,000 something feet, roughly 1.36 miles long on each side of the building. 1.36 miles long, that's a big building. And so the solar circumference would be about four and a half miles around, a little bit more than that, around the whole building. About four, almost four, six miles around the building. That would, to take a walk around the one building, that's why he said it looks like an entire city. The temple would have a giant outer square wall with three gates. Inside the square wall is the outer courtyard, which resembled chambers. A set of buildings with a square which would house the outer courtyards. Immediately inside the chambers is the inner courtyard, and this inner courtyard has an inner temple. Now the, the, the temple is much larger. Even the altar in front of the temple is bigger than the whole entire Old Testament temple. Just the altar to burn the sacrifices. Bigger than the Old Testament temple building. So it's much, everything's much larger. But there's not land right now to build a temple like that. So in any model the temple Jewish rabbis make of this temple, they, they always make the temple similar to the temple of Herod, but very tall, like seven, eight stories tall. But it's not taller, it's wider. Specifically, it's wider in the Bible. But there's not room enough yet. But the Bible says Mount of Olives will split and go away and become a huge valley. Will it be the valley of the judgment of the, of the sheep and goats. And then Mount Moriah and Mount Zion and the next mountain where the Russian compound will shoot up and combine and become one new combined mountain. And then there will be room for the much bigger temple. 
in the time of the millennium. And a spring will gush forth and go to the, from one side to the, to the Dead Sea, and the upper half of the Dead Sea will come to life again with fish, and become then a stream with a river going all the way to the Mediterranean, and you can then take a ship all the way from the Mediterranean to the Dead Sea, coming in uh, like sightseeing, just coming on your boats or just shipping that way in the millennium time. Then things will change. But Jerusalem will be suspended up on this big mountain, and everything around it will become like a flat, low land area, but Jerusalem will be suspended up on a great mountain, and it will all be covered with the Shekinah glory cloud of God. By the way, it's designed with throne rooms in it. The Bible says it will have uh, 389 stations for judges to sit with him on the thrones of the house of David, according to Psalm 122, verses 1 to 5. So this building is designed to have 389 stations of throne rooms built around the outer wall, inside the outer wall. So some people will actually sit in these thrones and rule and reign with the Lord in the temple itself. I don't think I will, but I think some people close to the Lord, maybe Paul or somebody, might be up there in those close, thrones close to the Lord. We'll all be serving in some way with the Lord. And the prophecy of Ezekiel's prophecy is truly a wonder of the world. Today there's not enough room, but there will be when, there, when that mountains are changed and then it's the altar of God in the center. Christ will be the high priest in the next temple, the supreme ruler of the courts of the temple and the overseer of the world. He will establish peace, justice, and righteousness, and the world will be a world of place of wonderment. We've never seen a world made up entirely of righteousness, a world of peace without any violence of wars, and blessed with many, many manifold blessings. It will literally be a world beyond our comprehension to be ruling and reigning with Christ. That's why when Christ is sitting upon his throne, covered in the glory of God, and you see Jesus on his throne, it's hard for people to imagine Jesus who came as a little baby to be born and raised and then to be crucified and risen again. He'll still have then the, the scars in his hands and his feet showing he was crucified. Now in that new living, that new eternal, immortal body, he'll have the resurrection body. We also who have been resurrected or, ra or raptured either and taken and brought back with the Lord will also have a new body. But he'll bear in his marks, in his body, the marks of the cross. But other than that, he'll be so glorified, people cannot imagine it. So the Bible says there'll be sacrifices again to illustrate to the millennial people how Jesus came to be a savior, how he came to be a sacrifice of the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. So they'll understand it and then they'll be saved who have been born during the time of the millennium who can turn to the Lord. And at the end of that time, well, the Antichrist will, will I'm not Antichrist, the Satan himself will, will bring up a rebellion and God will just destroy them with fire, fire from heaven and set up the new kingdom of the new heaven and new earth. But this time will be an amazing time. By the way, the temple and all the city will be covered with the Zechariah glory cloud of God. The entire temple and the city will be covered with the Zechariah glory cloud. Can you imagine well, seeing from a long ways away, here's that, there's the city up on the hill and there's the glory of God hanging over it like a great cloud of glory hanging over it. That's God's presence over all the city. His glory will be defense, a shadow from heat, a refuse in covert from a storm, and a symbol of his eternal love and presence. God will be with us and we can live in the presence of Jesus every day. We will see Jesus, our Savior and Lord, and abide with him who loved us and gave himself for us. We can worship him in his holy temple and see Jesus on his omnipotent throne. We will serve him daily in the kingdom of peace. Jesus will also be that loving shepherd who watches over us and carries in his arms, carries us in his arms, who gently leads us every day. And he'll be that friend that seeketh closer than a brother. We can experience that glory of God personally and live in his presence forever. Think about what an amazing day that will be to be with God and see God and his glory in the sanctuary. God will have a temple like this in the future millennium time, a temple really beyond our comprehension. And God's presence will be with us for that thousand years. Those of us who are believed, who believe in the Lord, will be taken in the rapture and will go to be with the Lord in heaven. But if you're not believed in the Lord, you will go through that dreaded tribulation period. And the Bible says that three-fourths of the world will die. For instance, if there's uh, as many as eight to nine billion people by the time of the tribulation, as many as six billion people could die during the tribulation period. Can you imagine? So it'd be a horrible time to be in, and you'll be deceived to follow the wrong teaching. You could be saved though now, and know Jesus is your Savior. God loves you. He came to be your Savior. He died on the cross, paying for your sin and my sin. He loves you and offers you salvation now. God is coming, He came to be your personal Savior. If you only repent and believe in Jesus as your Savior, you don't do good works. 
You don't have to join the church. You don't have to be baptized. You just believe in Jesus as your Savior, turning to your sin and turning to the Savior. And you can know Jesus personally as your friend, Jesus personally as your Savior, and know heaven as your home one day. And then one day we'll come back with the Lord and be in that millennial kingdom. Ruling and reigning with the Lord forever. What a wonderful time it will be. Now we know there's terrible wars going on now. But don't worry. Don't fret. Jesus is still on the throne. God will have a victory over all these things. We just need to do what we can now to tell somebody about Jesus. Because Jesus is coming back soon. We need to tell our friends and family. Try to alert these people here in Franklin to know about the Lord. If you have family or friends somewhere nearby, call them. Tell them to come to church. Hear the gospel. Or witness to them yourself. And win them at home. And then bring them here to know more about God and to win others. Because we don't have long left. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready for that day? God is coming soon. I hope you are. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time we've had today to look at your word. We ask, Lord, you'd move in a mighty way among hearts. Help us to know you as our personal Savior. If there's anyone who's not saved, help them to repent of their sin. Just as I did as a little boy, say, I want to know Jesus as my Savior today. I want to know how heaven is my home. And if they are saved, Lord, help anyone not, that is saved today, that already knows you as Savior, to say, I want to serve God in the time we have left. Jesus is coming soon. I'm going to bring others into the kingdom and know Jesus as their Savior too. So that my friends, my family, anyone who I might meet, I can tell about the Lord. Use this in a mighty way in the days we have left. In your holy and precious name, amen. Uh -huh.